El profesor David Caruso trabaja en la, una prestigiosa universidad americana, en la Yale University. Colabora con los profesores Peter Salovey, con el profesor John Mayer y es uno de los representantes defensores del modelo de habilidad de la inteligencia emocional. Es experto dentro de la inteligencia emocional en aspectos que tienen que ver con la evaluación. Es uno de los coautores del famoso Mesquite, del Mayer, Mayer Salovey Caruso Emotional Intelligent Test. Es un autor que tiene un libro muy prestigioso que, con, eh, escrito con Peter Salovey que se llama El líder emocionalmente inteligente. Y que es un libro que recomiendo encarecidamente porque es un libro no solo teórico sino también práctico. We believe that emotional intelligence is a form of intelligence. It's the ability to think about emotions, the ability to think with emotion to help you cope and thrive in the world. There are four parts to the model. First, to identify emotions accurately. That was the mood meter. I asked, how did you feel? Two, use emotions to help you think. How you feel influences how you think. Three, understand the causes of emotion. Why do you feel the way you feel? And four, manage emotions to make good decisions and to take effective action. And this is how we teach managers, leaders, and school teachers. We talk about how you feel, we talk about the model, and this is the language that we use. The traditional view of emotion sees that emotions and reasoning are opposites. That emotions are chaotic, that they are haphazard, random. We have a different view. It's a more intelligent view of emotion. In our view, an emotion occurs when there's a change in the environment. An emotion occurs quickly. It changes what you're paying attention to. It changes certain physical feelings. It motivates behavior. And it serves an adaptive function. What if this was a rock? And the rock is coming, and you're looking at it and thinking, hmm, he's throwing something. I wonder what it is. Could be a rock. I wonder if it's going to hit me. Well, maybe not. And that's the rational approach. Meanwhile, <laughs> surprise serves an adaptive function because In surprise, the eyes are open, and that allows you to see what's going on. The mouth is open. In fact, you went, oh, what is that doing? You're also ready to scream in case I have more things I'm going to throw, because emotions serve an adaptive function. It helps you cope and to thrive in the world around you. So emotions are smart. That is where we start from. Emotions have lots of information and data. Not only are emotions okay, they are vital to making good decisions. Darwin says emotions are universal across species. You're walking outside, Santander, and you see this animal, and what are you going to do? You can say, oh, here, nice puppy, come here. Or will you run away? You'll probably run away. Emotions have universal meaning. We are happy because we gain something of value. 
We are sad because we lose something of value. But specific causes may differ. Specific causes vary by person. There was a study a few years ago in organizations in the United States, and the questions were, what is the most expressed emotion in the workplace? And the answer is? Anger, number one. What is the least expressed emotion at work? Joy, joy. Now, we can also measure this. There are several ways to measure something. But we believe emotional intelligence is an intelligence, it's an ability. It's very important to measure emotional intelligence as an intelligence. And my colleagues and I developed an objective test for emotions. It has right and wrong answers. It is objectively scored. It's based on the fact that emotions are data. And it uses a panel of emotions experts to determine the best answers. Let me show you some examples. Which emotion would be most likely to lead someone to agree to help you with a project? Are you going to ask an angry person, a sad person, or a happy person to help you with a difficult project? Will you ask a sad person? Or will you ask a happy person? They are more likely to say, sure, I'll help you. Now, these are not real items on the mesquite. They're similar, they're samples. But it gives you an idea that we feel the best way to measure an intelligence is through an objective measure. And we use what's called expert scoring on the mesquite. And we'll we find, by the way, that the mesquite is a difficult test to administer because people are oftentimes surprised by their results. Here is the problem. Our self-estimates are oftentimes very in inaccurate. When we ask high school students to rate themselves on their ability to get along with others, less than 1% say they're below average. Weather forecasters' predictions are much more accurate than physicians. Why is that? It's the impact of feedback. We don't have the opportunity to exchange that information. So I think I'm very good at identifying emotions when I'm actually terrible at it because we don't get feedback. Which is why we feel it's very important to evaluate your emotional intelligence in an objective manner. Some outcomes that we see, people who have high ability EI get into less fights, show more pro-social behavior, they have better quality relationships, more empathy, create a more positive work environment, Teams that are higher in EI have faster cohesion. They work together better. We asked a question in one research study. You're the CEO. If you were to leave the company, which people do you take with you? And they picked the people high in EI. I want you, and I want you, and I want you. The high EI people. People higher on Mesquite, higher in ability EI, find it easier to process social problems. It's almost unbelievable. The correlation is a small sample, but it's an almost unbelievably high correlation. Let me show you some case studies. We had boys and girls. We measured their IQ and their emotional intelligence. And we asked them about a time they felt pressured to do something they did not want to do. Here's an example. 
Here's someone very high verbal intelligence, average emotional intelligence. Here's the story. My friends wanted me to beat the hell out of someone. Violence makes me uncomfortable. My friends won. So I fought the other person, but I did it in a way that really wouldn't hurt him. A very smart boy with average emotional intelligence. He's using his analytical ability to justify fighting. So that's some background. Let's talk quickly about how we also teach some of these abilities to educators, to students, to leaders, and to managers. We start with identify emotions. Emotions contain data. Um, Mark Brackett and I use what we, again, call the mood meter. We use this with children, young children, age five, to CEOs of companies. How do you feel? And we ask them to record their feelings every day, several times a day. When we want to get people to use emotions, we sometimes share this quote. We say, effective leadership involves the use of emotion, often through symbolic management, where the leader uses symbols, stories, rituals, to rouse and motivate staff, to guide them toward achievement of a shared vision. Has anyone here ever heard a good speech? Has anyone ever inspired you? This is an ability. So I won't do this now, but we teach our students, teachers, and leaders to think of a time you felt a strong emotion and to tell the story so that you generate the feelings in you and also in your listeners. To teach emotional empathy. And it works quite well. We also teach this. This is our mood meter. We believe that emotions are smart. All emotions are smart. Is it ever smart to be angry? Can you think of a time when you were angry and it was the right way to feel? Anger rises out of a sense of injustice. What you said is wrong and I'm going to fight. Without anger, there would not be women in this room. So we teach people that you need to access the full range of emotion to be an effective teacher and an effective leader. Understand emotions. So it's important to understand the causes of emotions for you, but as a leader, as a manager, for your staff as well. And it's a great exercise to be able to do. We also teach people a, a vocabulary. It's important to be able to, to communicate using complex emotion terms. The fourth ability is manage emotions. And uh, my colleagues and I have developed what we call a blueprint for emotions. Again, it's very simple, but leaders, teachers, and even school children have been taught this approach to better understanding your emotions, those of other people, and how to solve problems. You have a difficult situation. How did each person feel? What was each pay, pay, uh, person paying attention to? What caused you to feel this way? And what did you do to manage your emotions and those of others? It's a very simple approach, but for people who are not trained in emotions, it's a very powerful approach as well. So we give these out to, again, to leaders, to teachers, to students, 
and think of a recent difficult situation, complete the mood meter, including asking the last question, and what could you do now to make it better? I use this in my home all the time. Because what I do at home is I forget about all this, I make a big mistake, and I have to go to the last question, what could you do now? And usually what I have to do is, sweetheart, I'm, I was wrong. You were right. And I will never do that again. And I do that several times a day. And that seems to work. Now, here's a great question for the researchers here. Uh, does this work? Do these interventions work? And I have to tell you something. Uh, there's very limited data. Very limited data. Researchers here know that. If you're applying this work, I urge you, I encourage you, I beg you to work with researchers to address these issues. There's very little data on the effectiveness of ability-based EI interventions with adults. Very little. Uh, Professor Boyatzis has some great data on competencies, which I believe he'll share with you tomorrow. But when it comes to uh, the mayer salive model, we have very limited data. We like to stress that emotions contain data, and therefore you need to stay open to those feelings, whether they're comfortable or uncomfortable. Emotions contain data. I, I like that phrase. It really gets people thinking. Our best audiences are lawyers, IT, professionals, engineers, physicians. They're all very smart. They all think this is, I don't know if you can translate the word, they all think this is bullshit. And that's why they're the best audience. Because we have, it's an ability-based approach that says emotions contain data. It gets their attention. And we have a problem-solving template for them to use. You all give talks. You all have meetings. How do you end your meetings or your talks? Where would you want the audience to be on the mood meter? Would you want them to be on this side of the mood meter? Yes. yes. Would you want them to be here, bottom right? Maybe, some of you would. They'll be reflective, they'll think about it. Would you want them to be up here? Yes. Some of you would say yes. It depends on your goal. If you want people coming out feeling energetic, oh, this was great, I can apply this. If you want them to be more thoughtful, down here. Well, I would like you to, as much as possible, I want to end here. And to do this, I need you all to stand up. So please stand up. Ready? I am jumping for joy. All right, thank you. <laughs>